Hey everybody, and Kevin, thank you very much for joining us today. Folks, today I got Kevin Fuqua with me. He's one of uh, my very good friends that I met some, man, it's been a minute. Yeah, it's, it's been, been a, a minute. 15, 20 years ago. Wow. Probably 15, somewhere around there. Wow, okay. He was one of the first guys that I met when I was uh, traversing the, the appraisal stages up in the Ann Arbor area. And uh, he befriended me and 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 put me down, uh, kept me out of getting in trouble, answered my questions when I had them. And so today he's going to continue that process and he's going to share with me, share with us, excuse me, uh, some of the things that he's been into. Now, one of the things that I, I will say this, Kevin is many things uh, just running through the list. One, he's a realtor. His wife is, I believe she's the only black broker, broker. in at, at yeah. Keller Williams. Yep, Ann Arbor. In in Arbor. Two. In Arbor. Three. Kevin is a basically a full-time investor. I think right now he's got at least three projects going on, probably yeah. as many up to five. Yeah. Two more uh, coming. He's a net, he's an amazing networker. And he's an awesome connector. And he's a money getter. So wait a minute. That's I mean, I got a lot of, I'm running out of fingers. Right. And I'm sure there's a bunch of other stuff that Kevin does that I don't even know about. So today uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk to him. And one, the first thing I always wanna know is Kevin, how'd you get into real estate, man? That's a long story, but I'll, I'll, I'll go back all the way back to uh, probably the seventies, man, when we watched these uh, infomercials for real estate on TV, um, that was, how I really got in the bug to get into okay. real estate. The Carlton um, Sheets? Carlton Sheets. Carlton Sheets, right? So I followed through um, and got my license probably in the 80s. But the first time I did it, you know, I passed the course, got my license, interviewed with a bunch of real estate agencies. And at that point, I wasn't ready. I won't get into all the details, but I, I, I just wasn't ready to get into real estate as a realtor. So I didn't get involved. So um, fast forward, uh, into the 90s, um, I was working full time, had a great job, but I also had a buddy of mine who was a very successful real estate agent. And I expressed to him that my desire to get into real estate and that at some point that I wanted to come to work for him as a buyer's agent. He said, OK, although it was half hearted, he thought I was joking. So when the day my exit day came for my job, um, I basically extricated from a job and then went to work for him as a buyer's agent. And the rest is history. That's how I met my wife. Who was the broker and um i got in the she real was estate a broker then my, my wife was a broker she's been a broker for almost 40 years yeah so you were working with her as yeah. as as an employee in the brokerage yeah. as an agent yeah as an agent as an agent before we started yeah that's a whole nother story man we'll talk about that mm -hmm. at, at, hey okay. so um but fast forward to now as far as getting into investing and i got into investing out of working with other investors who I was finding properties for, selling properties to, and also involved in uh, renovating properties for them when it was time for them to sell properties, rental properties, and they wanted to liquidate them. They asked me if I would do so, but these properties needed work. And so I then put together my renovation crew and did the renovations for them and then sold the property for them. Out of that, I got into buying and flipping properties. Now, the first thing that I did was I joined um, and I'm telling you this is a, as a roadmap to the people who are listening. Join your okay. local real estate investor. Okay. That's the first thing. With that, you'll find like-minded people. All the resources that you'll need to get involved in real estate will be there. You'll have wholesalers there with properties to sell. You'll have home inspectors there. You'll have uh, basically sources of financing there, um, as well as any other, uh, you know, different iterations of real estate investing you want to get into, they'll, they'll have. There's very aggressive groups here in Michigan, Southeastern Michigan, uh, Oakland County, um, as well as uh, Wayne County. I'm in, I'm in Washtenaw County, but I work basically a three or four county area with my investing. Okay. Um, okay. So that you won't have a problem there. The information available today is almost unfathomable to Amazing. where it was like 20, 20, 20 years ago. 25 years ago, everything is available at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. There are a number of uh, very active groups out there putting out content for investors. Um, so you can learn a lot. 
just mm-hmm. doing it online, just learning about it online. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bigger Pockets is one, one big one that I always tell people to go to because people ask me, um, how do I get involved in real estate? So for me, I'm always willing to give information is, you know, because that's how I got into the business. And I always wanted to do it to kind of give back, uh, whether I mentor people or whether I'm just connecting them with other other sources, whether it be a money source, believe it or not, or sources for other information okay. as well. Um, they may need somebody to do a renovation for them, an electrician or a plumber or a carpenter or a painter. Um, these people don't work for me, they work with me. So anytime I can give them access to extra work, I'm, I'm happy to do that um, as well. So the first thing is to take action. And that action would be to join your local real estate investor group. And as a, um, as a side of that, not just join, but join and actively participate. Actively participate. Yeah, because uh-huh. they do have um, information sessions where they'll always ask who's new, who's, who's new to the group, and so on and so forth. And you have all different age groups. That's the other thing. I mean, I'm, I'm probably in the middle to the older um, age groups there, but there are younger people in their 20s or maybe even in their teens who are getting into real estate. Mm. So I would tell anybody that wants to get into it, definitely give it a shot. Um, you don't have to spend any money to find out, you know, get the, pull the information because it's readily available. YouTube is replete with information. It really is. Mm-hmm. So step number one, get off your butt and get to a real a RIA. And that's yes. Real Estate Investment Association. That's RIA, R-E-I-A. And they're plentiful everywhere. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, you can probably just go to Google, put in yep. your county in RIA, R-E-I-A, and you, a list will pop up. Yep, that's correct. Okay, okay, good deal. So that's step number one. Step number two, uh, it's right along that, that taking action part. You've always been an action taker. You've yep. always done now it. Guy. I always tell people I'm a now guy. I don't let, you know, the opportunities when they put it in front of you, you don't know how long they're going to be there. So you really do need to take a look at the opportunity if you're interested. So, yes. Just do it. So along that theme, one of the things that I've noticed about you over the last five years or so, you have really been focusing on flipping houses on, on, on what was the impetus for that? Why? I mean, I know you've always sold houses and I know you've always been renovating them and whatnot. But over these last five years, you've wrapped it up quite a bit. Yeah, so I decided that I didn't want to be a landlord. I have friends of mine and business colleagues that either are landlords or they run property management companies. Okay. And um, for me right now, I'm still constantly just building up my capital base. If I do, and when I do buy a property, it's going to be a multi-unit. It's going to be probably a mid-sized multi-unit, meaning six to 10 units or more. Okay. Um, so for that, you need a fairly substantial amount of capital to do that. And so that's one of the main reasons why I have not focused on just the buy and hold. Now, I do okay. have some investors who strictly are buy and hold, um, which is the fastest way to build build wealth, bar none. Um, but for me right now, I'm focusing on the, on the buy and flip side of it. Okay. So a lot of the people that, that I run across, mm-hmm. um, they we talk about real you know we talk about real estate all the time right yeah <laughs> that, that's you and i for for us to talk about real estate is not a big deal because that's what we do all day every day i'm yeah. happy to do it but one of the things that i find is there are oftentimes a lot of misconceptions about real estate and what it takes to be successful whether mm-hmm. you're flipping or whether you're buying a home especially mm-hmm. and here's here's the funny part especially as you get older especially as I'm talking to people who, who are maturing. Like right mm-hmm. now, I'm 50. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, that's not true. I'm 51. I just forget. <laughs> Is that what happens when you get older? You start forgetting? Yeah, a little bit of that, yeah. <laughs> OK, so what's, what one of the things that's interesting to me is that even though I know, and we all know, that generally speaking, real estate is one of the ways that the wealthy stay wealthy and get even wealthier, mm-hmm. we know that from a yep. book standpoint. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, it seems like a lot of the people that I come across, especially in my age group, mm-hmm. as they're approaching that, get, they're not retiring yet, but you know, it's it's in the site, right? Mm-hmm. As they're starting to see that real estate scares the hell out of them. <laughs> in their head, it's so many unknowns. Well, mm-hmm. what happens if, in the terms of flipping, well, what if I don't find anybody to, you know, to fix the property? I don't know, wholesale it. Well, <laughs> what, if, what if, I don't know how to wholesale. What da, 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 da. How do you get around that? For me personally, I don't think about it. 
I mean, dude, I'm I'm over sixty, right? It. So I'm, I'm 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 over sixty. It's not that I don't think about it. It's not like it it comes into my head and I force it out. It it I I don't want to say that I know all the answers because I don't. But I'd say probably ninety percent of the problems that people would run into either a I've encountered them, or b I know how to work around them. Okay. Right. Or okay. c I put plans in place if I don't run into them. That's right. Right. That's right. So it doesn't it doesn't scare me when people tell me about the uh, property that you know you know me I, if the property's damn near falling down I still may be interested in buying it I get excited the worse condition the property the more excited I get because I know I'm going to get a deal but with that said I do my due diligence right so part of that due diligence in, in buying real estate is all of the inspections you do on the front end of the property now it's always for me money well spent mm-hmm. you know, I may spend five hundred, four, five hundred dollars to determine I don't want to buy the property, but that's rare for me. And I'll use you as an example. So all the properties you've shown me, I think I bought them all, right? <laughs> One or two. <laughs> One or two you did. So, right? Hurt my feelings. I had to go find somebody else, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, I keep asking you, what do you got, man? Send me more that's properties. That's true. You do. Yeah, I just asked you the do. Other day, what else you got, man? So... But I know enough about inspecting, and that comes from being a real estate agent and going through home inspections with a home inspector. And typically, I, I personally use the same home inspector because he's been in the business 40 years. He knows everything. Mm-hmm. He's also been an instructor. So um, he's taught me a lot. So when I walk into a property like any of your properties, I can walk into them and do a mini home inspection on the front end, right? To know enough to say, hey, I want to take the next step, and that's that's basically putting it on the contract and then doing a further in-depth inspection of the property, right? So at that point, um, you know, I'm already putting my numbers together in my head. You know, am I going to have to put a new roof on the house? What's the roof? Am I going to have to put a new driveway? And we talked about this with the property we're working on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did the home inspection yesterday. Um, and uh, so, and then I know where I can get, if I got to put windows in the property, I know where I can buy windows at a good price that where it makes sense for me to put new windows in the house. Um, flooring, you know, drywall, I got good painters. Um, I have a paint company, but the paint company owner is also an investor partner of mine, so I can get a great paint job done at a reasonable price. Mm-hmm. That was something that just came into, um, you know, into being for me. I have a good electrician. I have a couple of electricians that I work with. So, and then I know when I'm looking at a property from those particular, um, disciplines what I'm going to need, right? Because most properties I buy, they're they're functionally obsolete in terms of the kitchens especially. They typically don't have all of the new amenities electrically to, um, you know, that people are looking for. They may not have a dishwasher. So if it doesn't have a dishwasher, I've got to go in and wire for that, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then you've got to have separate wiring for your garbage disposal, all of the electrical requirements that that are, that's code. So I understand that I have a basic understanding of that. So when I walk in, I know it and I know what it's going to cost to do it. So it, it doesn't frighten me. So I know, I know that stuff. So um, I guess to answer your question, why those things don't confuse and confound and worry me is because I've gone through it enough times over the years. And then I have enough people uh, in my quiver that if I something I don't know, I can call them. I can call my buddy as a home inspector and just ask him questions right off the top. You know, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? Because and he can give me resources like that, like the roof. He looked at the roof from that house and he said, you got five years left on it. You don't have to replace it. I was looking at replacing the roof, which he said, no, that saved me five, oh, five six thousand dollars. Yeah, because he and said, I don't have to do it. You yeah. know, he said, put this stuff on the roof, wet and forget. And your roof is fine. You got to so change a hundred bucks you, for a hundred bucks. Yeah. You save six thousand. I saved six thousand bucks. Right. And so but the other thing with him is he understands government guidelines right he understands fha guidelines which you and i talked about yep we may get into it this in this call or not uh, but at some point um you know investors are going to have to understand that because that's when i do my buy my properties to sell them i'm selling typically to first-time home buyers and they're typically fha buyers and i know i'm going to have to pass an fha appraisal inspection and so yeah. when i do my properties i make sure that when they're complete that they will pass that inspection the first time yeah. right off the 
Yeah, and that's to be honest with you, as a as a appraiser, I've been appraising for almost coming on twenty years now. One of the things that not only the 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 brokerage stuff that I did prior to that, but one of the things that I find that's really amazing to me, and even today, when I come across properties that have been rehabbed, mm -hmm. they suck. Yeah, they do. Let me say something to you, as a friend. You suck. I've seen your properties. Your properties are absolutely amazing. Matter of fact, uh, you're you. Oftentimes, you're so. If this is the level of the neighborhood, you're t you tend to be a little bit higher than that. Yeah, right? I, I do. I do on purpose. It's not wanna, a lot higher, but within reason. Yeah, yeah. And I want to get I want to get the, the best pro price possible. And to get that, typically the difference in money I have to spend is minimal. Yeah. Okay. When I'm looking at because again I'm going at it from a a buyer mentality, right? Because I work with first time home buyers all the time, and I know what they're looking for. They want turnkey. And mom always wants a nice kitchen. You know, kitchens and baths are what sells homes, as well as getting them in the front door with nice curb appeal, right? Mm -hmm. That's an indicator of what's going to be in the house. So I typically will do a nice landscaping, something that's clean, not over the top, but that's clean and inviting on the front front end of the house. It's not super expensive to do, but you know, I, I always do that. But in the inside, I think every house I've done, every house I do, I put granite in. Every single house. Okay. I put granite in. And, and now I'm always, I'm putting in the tile backsplash. Now, for me, it's maybe a few thousand dollars more ultimately. But every house I've sold in the last 24 months has only been on the market for about a week. And that's why. When they walk in the door, you can't do anything else to that kitchen. I got, I put a nice kitchen cabinet in with soft clothes mechanisms, which you'll find in a half million dollar house. I got a good supplier for that. Granite countertops, tile backsplash, stainless steel dishwasher and microwave. There's nothing else you can do in that kitchen. Okay. Are you else. finding that you're bumping that line though? Because you know, there you, we we talk about this too. There is that line, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's that line of being slightly better than your immediate area to bring to yeah. attract and being right. way above. Right, 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 right. So, but again, I'm looking at the real, the actual dollars, the actual dollars, right? So for me to push that envelope, the difference might be $2,500. But time on market is a week. So I'm saving, you know, the, so but remember my money is borrowed. So every day that a house sits out there done is costing me money every single day. You and I have talked about this, the cost of capital, right? So I may be putting it in on the, on the front end, but I'm saving it on the back because I'm basically, instead of it being a, a four month sales cycle, it's usually six weeks or an eight or an eight week sales cycle cycle is usually, it's usually six weeks from the time I put it in the market to the time I get it sold. And then I know it's gonna pass the inspection. So I don't have to worry about them coming back to me with inspection requirements, mm -hmm. unless it's something totally unforeseen. So we get, we get that stuff, we get that stuff handled. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so yeah, I'll use, um, like, I don't know if you saw my house, the Tuttle Hill property. You didn't, did you see, you didn't see Tuttle Hill. That was one I did this summer. And uh, that house, I wound up, uh, I put a new roof on it, all new windows throughout the whole house, granite in the kitchen, granite in the bathroom. Uh, I gutted, I gutted the kitchen, the bath down to the studs and the subfloor. Actually, no, studs to the studs and floor joists. So okay. I pulled up the flooring and I pulled out took the walls down. The, re the reno was um, about 35 on that one. But the my ARV when I bought it was 185. ARV right. being after repair value. Right. Yeah, after repair value. But when I sold it, I sold it for 220. Nice. So all yeah. the other homeowners love me, right? Because I, I, I raised the market. I raised the bar. Raised the market. I, raised, I raised the market over there. So now they their comps and also the other thing too, I'm a little competitive. So there, if there's investors out there who are doing as good or better job than me, I want to be as good as, good as they are or better, right? Okay. So that was something that I didn't even know I had, but I saw some other investors. I'm like, I got to step my game up. So it depends on how I bought the property. I got the property at a pretty decent price. I could have got it better, but we won't get into the, into that. But it was I could have got it cheaper, but it just didn't work. So one of the things I'm going to digress for a minute. I like about working with you is there's no daisy chain of wholesalers. It's just you, you and me doing the deal. Um, and that was something that I learned the hard way uh, last year, 
right? And I think I talked about it and I didn't know that the, the wholesalers don't tell you that there's there's four other hands in this deal. Um, you know, it's gone through two or three other wholesalers to get to me and they all have their hands out. They all want a piece of it, which drives the, the sale price up on the property and, and takes out and typically crushes the profit also. But that's what, so why when you call me, I jump on the properties. So, right, right. So that goes back to not waiting, right? But the other part of that is when a wholesaler knows that they've got an investor like me who acts quickly, and when he says he's buying a property, he buys it, he executes, they're more apt to call me first. Now, 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 say it. Do it now. Do it now. That is true. Right? That is true. You call me. When I ho- when I wholesale, pre- there are very few people that I call. I mean, it, well, let me let me change that. I I usually, if I get a property under contract and I know I'm going to wholesale it and I know I'm not going to keep it, yeah. um, within a few days of me getting under contract and making sure everything is okay, yeah. I I before I market it to anybody else, I do make some personal calls. Right. That's that's a, and that's a business decision, right? Because right. <laughs> because right. to your point. Yeah. As an as an investor that wholesales properties at time, I don't you know I don't really want to de- I I don't want to deal with the headache of trying to figure out if this sucker is going to close or not. Correct, correct, I- exactly. That that's exactly right. So reputation and, matters uh, when it comes to that. Yes, and so my reputation in the investor community and the wholesale community, if I'm working with them, if I tell them I'm buying and I buy it and I close <laughs> within a reasonable amount of time, I don't yep. stretch them out for two, three, four months. You know, it's usually within. You know the standard amount of time you know tw- what 30 to 60 days we, we close you know that's typically and that's i understand that reputation matters right um and even with my contractors they know if i call them they typically answer my phone call because they know i'm going to pay them on time and that's another point yep right you've got to get good contractors but when you get good contractors you take care of them yep and, and part of that is just paying them when you say you're going to pay them you know um because I've found good good contractors are hard to come by. You know, I've gone through enough bad ones to know that. And so the good ones, I, I value and I treasure them. And uh, there's a certain amount of loyalty between me and between them. Now they're working for other people too, sure. but they know me, um, there's not gonna be any headaches. I'm not gonna be wishy-washy. I'll make a decision, I'll stand by it, and then we'll move forward. Sure. You know, and then if something does blow up, they know that I'm not gonna be one of those guys that just loses his mind. Okay. We'll figure it out. And, you know, I don't usually, I'm not a guy who points finger. It was your fault. You, you F this up. How, what were you thinking? How dumb are you? I don't, these are all grown men. And I respect that. So I'm not going to, I don't do that. You know, they'll, they'll see that I'm sad and disappointed, but, you know, we, we're not going to get into any, um, you know, testosterone you, contest. So you're not going to pull a, a Draymond Green out of, <laughs> out of nowhere. Oh. I have met a lot of ass in my life, but you... One of the things that I, I find that's very interesting, again, in talking to folk is especially when you're dealing with either people who have flipped or have flipped maybe one house, maybe two, mm-hmm. versus like real professionals like yourself who are in the business actively doing four or five jobs at a time. Yeah. What are they, I get the impression, and, and this is just my impression, no one's ever said this to me. But I always get the impression that everybody's trying to count everybody else's money. In, in your case, one of the reasons, and I'm sure this is the case, one of the reasons that when you have an issue with a con- or you have a project that needs to be done and you pick up the phone and you call one of your contractors, I know one of the reasons they come and get it done is because one, they know you're, they're going to get paid. That's yeah. first. Yeah. And two, you're not going you're not going to nickel and nickel and dime them. Correct. As long as they do what they need to do. Right. Their price is their price. And um, that was something that I learned, I'll say the hard way to a certain degree. Okay. Uh, I've gone the cheap route before and believe me in real estate contracting, you get what you pay for. Yes, you There's do. no good guy that's gonna give you a, a you know a, a dollar discounted rate. But could you pay me in advance? <laughs> Not in this market when these guys can, they can demand and command whatever they wanna make. Not right now. We got we got we got such a shortage of trades. It's not even funny. And um, luckily for me, um, you know, my electrician, um, this guy is he's worth his weight in gold because he can do electrical. He can do plumbing. 
He can do HVAC. He can do drywall. He can do tile. All very well. He, he's amazing to me. I, I'm like, he's dude, a true craftsman, eh? Yes. And he's very fussy about his work, but he does it so well. All okay. of it. I, I, dude, I've never had a guy, I have, actually one other guy, God rest his soul, he passed away almost two years ago, who was like that, who could do everything and do it well. But in his case, he was a third generation contractor. His grandfather was a contractor. His father was a contractor. And then that's all he's ever done. So he learned from three three generations of contractors, and um, he was amazing, absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely amazing. And I cherished him like you know he was a, a diamond. You know, I mean, he was just he was, he was just so well. We got and we got along so well because I didn't have to worry about it. If he found a problem, he fixed. It. Yeah, and he charged me, yeah. which I I didn't care because once I understand the essence of the man. That's what I go on, right? I mean, just like if you, with your kids, you understand the essence of your kids. You got some that are angels and you got some that are knuckleheads, right? We all have them. So this guy was, he was a, he was a diamond. He, he handled his business. He was amazing to me. There were things that he would do that I would like, I, I won't even get into the stories. Mm-hmm. They were just too, too numerous, all good. But it was like, dude, why didn't you call me? He just handled it, right? He just handled it. You know, and so I've got one. I actually have two other guys that are like that now, and I love them. And, I, and the other thing is, I I let them know I appreciate them. You know, the money is one thing, but just you'll be amazed at how much just letting people know verbally how much you appreciate their work means to them. And that's got nothing to do with being a contractor or anything. That's just no. that's a life lesson. Yeah, I've that's yeah, yeah. It, it it is a life lesson. You're definitely you're definitely right about that. And that's why they keep coming back. And that's why they call me or I call them um, and we stay in, in, in touch and mm-hmm. we work well together. Because we, mm-hmm. so that's the other thing. We work through multiple projects now and they know how I operate. They know what I expect. They know what I want. Um, and um, so that's the other thing. They understand the essence of who I am, right? So it sounds like point number two that you've been saying here is to make sure that you're building a team and understand yes. that that's what, that you're a yeah. part of the team. You, you, can't, not... yeah, you can't succeed alone. They say, what did say? You run faster by yourself, but you run farther in a group. Yeah. I think that's the. I think that's, the yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you run fast, faster by yourself, but you run farther in a group. Um, so building the team is important. And that goes back to going to these RIAs. They'll all know contractors who they can recommend. Um, and, and getting referrals on contractors, especially if you're new, is key. If you don't have a family member or a good friend that's a contractor that does some certain things, you want to get referrals. And, and those referrals are recent in terms of the work that they've done, which most contractors today, um, uh, you know, have been working steadily through. You know, so that won't be hard to do to find out to find references for. Mm-hmm. But that's also important because I know builders. Um, who I have builder buddies who are in and so, but they're 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 super busy right now. Um, but you know, every now and again, I can pot- potentially peel off one of their guys on the, in the slow season. Like there's one buddy of mine we went to college together, and he's got a, a carpenter, a finished carpenter, that's done work for me on off season. The guy's work is in, is impeccable. He could build a house, but in the off season, you know, he's working maybe 20, 30 hours a week. So he'll come out and you know he'll hang cabinets for me. He'll put down my my base and my shoe and my hang my doors you know and he'll i mean but he's used to that 10 12 14 hour day so he's you know he can get stuff done very quickly and very efficiently so even though i may be paying a little bit more the level of efficiency is there so instead of it taking the guy you know three four days he can get it done in one or two which you means know? which going back to that original point is less money out of your pocket less because money you can get it done faster it's just less money out of my pocket yeah true Yep. There, there we go. There we go. So we, I guess we've we've hit two things. One, so if anybody out there who is interested has been playing in their head that they want to get in the flipping game, one, you need to uh, squad up, get yourself to a RIA, mm-hmm. start building the team, ask yeah. questions, get yeah. involved. That's yeah. one. Yeah. Two, going along with that theme, start building your team of contractors and whatnot. Because mm-hmm. your, your team and the way you treat them, the relationships that you build with them mm-hmm. are, are going to really determine how far you're going to go in this business. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, very, very true. Now, one of the things I want to kind of back up to, especially being in RIAs, there may be an opportunity for you to um, maybe partner on a project. That might not be a bad way to, to do okay. Um, either with 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 money and sweat equity or maybe just money. Um, that's a good way to learn as well. You know, if they've got a seasoned investor out there, because I know there were some that were that were, you know, had mentees, people that they were, you know, teaching in the business. And and um, they came and they, you know, they brought money to the project and then they they worked it together and they, and they learned from there. Um, how can you tell just, who's a how can you tell who's the real deal and who's talking? Well, okay, so at the RIA groups, um, you know, one of the things, I guess one of the things you could do is a lot of times they may be talking about projects they worked on, but normally whoever the, the president or director of the RIA group is, that person knows the players. So that would be where I would start and say, hey, who would be a good person for me to learn from? You know, because you can open it up when you stand up and introduce yourself, you know, you can say, well, I'm looking to start this, but I, you know, I wanna, I wanna learn. You know, I want to, I want to learn. So coming to those meetings, sitting in, um, and just learning for, you know, a few meetings, but making people aware of who you are, and what you're trying to do is key, you know? So for me as a real estate agent, I guess to a certain degree, I may have had a leg up because, you know, um, you know, my understanding of real estate was maybe a little bit more detailed than just a newbie off the street, um, you know, so to speak. And, um, but my background in terms of construction and remodel was next to, was next to, was next to nothing. So I did have to rely on good contractors that I had, um, you know, basically in my, um, you know, in my, in my quiver to really guide me along. But I've learned, you know, as I, as I went along and then I did take the builder's class. So helping to learn code and stuff like that also helped as well but you don't have to do that you know you really you okay. really don't have to do that but um you know if you really want to learn that kind of stuff i mean you could start with youtube um you know your local community college uh, will have a lot of times they'll have builders classes or you know carpentry classes and things like that but for me people ask me do i swing a hammer my answer is unequivocally no i don't and my i always say i point and pay i don't I, I can only work one project, but I can manage a hundred. Okay. So if you really want to get the, the real key is learn to be a good project manager. So you can, okay. you can manage multiple projects, but you can only work on, you can only be in one place at one time. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Uh, so that would, that would be, it would be something, something else. And part of the project management part is, is um, there's software out there that you can use. I mean, for me right now, I hate to even admit it, but a lot of it's just in my head. You know, because projects have a certain really? uh, rhythm to them, right? And they have a certain flow. Yeah. They just they just do. They all have a certain flow to them. They all do. And so, um, like, for instance, when we looked at, you know, I keep going back to this, we were doing a deal together on Apple Ridge, right? I walked in. I like, I said, okay, so I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to gut the bathroom, the kitchen. I may not have to gut it, gut it, but I got to remove the cabinets. Flooring's got to be done. Looking at the lighting. Going to update the lighting. Panel box. Look at the panel box. Do I need a panel box? Is there enough space in it for me to add the extra circuitry that I need for, um, you know, the kitchen? I'm probably going to have to put a new panel box in, replumb it. How much is it going to cost to re to do it? You know, it's a three bedroom, one bath bungalow. My average cost is twenty five hundred dollars for a plumber to replumb it. Right off the top of my head, I know that because I've done enough of them. Right, furnace guy. My electrician is my furnace guy. I put a new furnace in that house. Uh, labor and materials, fifteen hundred dollars. You know, water heater. I usually usually say a thousand dollars for the water heater, but they could be less. That's with using a plumber and all that. Um, I did call. I think I, I shot you a text about the um, the blight bill for that house, but I also talked to them about all the things I wanted to do, what I would need permits for. So they, they, I told them, oh, this, 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 and this, I said, you're gonna need permits for all these things. So I'm like, okay, fine. So, I'm, you know, that cost is built in, but the margin on that particular property is so robust that it can absorb those costs, mm -hmm. right? So you gotta buy the property, right? That's, mm -hmm. you start buying them, that's the key. So buying the property right is two things cost of the property but also the location and area so for me i only buy in in a areas in the area it could be a high demand area or it could just be a area in terms of price and location 
but like Apple Ridge is, is an A area because of its the price point. And there wasn't anything else for sale. It's a first time home buyer program, house, and there's enough margin in there for me to incentivize buyers to buy it if I need to. But it also qualifies for rural development loan, which you may not know, which is a zero down loan. I didn't know that. No, you didn't. I'm telling you that now because I did my research. I, I got to tell you, you just hit me with a lot. There was a lot of information you just hit I'm me with. I'm sorry, man. That's cool. <laughs> but you know what's really cool, though? With like a, And folks, this is what's really cool about Kevin. Every time we talk about, every time we talk, period. And we don't always just talk about real estate. But somehow or another, real estate gets mixed up in there. And then we start talking about something else. Yeah. But he is a fount of knowledge. And again, this comes from his experience, yeah. his, uh, his his relationships that he's built, yeah. and his ability to get off his butt and get to it. Yeah. And yeah. I guess maybe it starts with that last one. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because ultimately, that's what it, that's what all this stuff really comes down to. Because one, he told he just told you, you don't have to. He can point and paint, or he can point and he can point and write a check. That's what he can do. But he's taking the time to fit. He's learned building uh, the building course. He's taking a builder course, so he understands that from a from an intellectual standpoint. So he knows when somebody's trying to snow him. That that's one. But here's the thing, and he and I'm sure he'll tell you this. Based on his experience, I'm sure he probably could have figured that out anyway, whether yeah. he took the building's co- bidder course or not. Yeah. And as you do the business, as you actually get out there and get into the world, into the flipping world, or the rehab world or whatever, as you get into it, uh, one of the things, you're going to start developing that BS meter, right? <laughs> you're going to yeah. know what makes sense and what doesn't. Like, you know that a furnace, that replacing the furnace doesn't cost you $12,000. I just, dude, I just had my neighbor across the street. They put a furnace and AC in 12 G's right across the street from me. Now they had come to me for one of my contractors. So I call and call and call. I already had my contractor lined up because he just put a furnace in my house. And I think it was about $2,000. Now remind you, I'm, you've never been to my house, but it's, it's, it's a little yeah. bigger house. It's <laughs> a little bigger, right. Okay. So I'm calling him. I'm like, I got my guy, he'll do, he'll put the furnace, he'll do the furnace and AC, labor materials for about six grand, right? But I said, do you want, do, but do you want like, what what brand of furnace do you want? Cause that does play into the cost because most of your furnaces, you have to have a dealership license to sell that furnace. Mm-hmm. You can't just walk into Home Depot. Home Depot would say, give me that one. Lowe's or Costco or any of these other places and get one of the name brand furnaces. Now, yep. quite frankly, most of those components are come from, coming from Korea or China anyway. So it really doesn't matter. But most people don't know that. They want to buy the brand name. Yeah. The furnace is gonna, it typically going to last you 15, 20 years anyway or longer. And the components are interchangeable. You can, pull a, you can pull a circuit board out, put another circuit board in, and away you go. But some people are, and nobody's going to see the brand. I mean, it's like, okay, it's not like I got my Mercedes parked in the, in the lot and people can see I drive Mercedes. You got a you got a, a Bryant furnace that costs you three thousand dollars more parked in the basement. Nobody will ever see. All they do is feel the fucking heat. Part of my They're just gonna feel the heat. So it doesn't matter. But to them it does, right? Yep. So a few days after that, um, so I don't see the neighbors, but you know it's okay. So then I see two, you know, mechanical trucks parked in the driveway. So then I go dr- rolling by the house and I see the husband walking out of the out of the house, out of the driveway. I said, I, I stopped. I said, you know, I tried to call you, right? You know, not to say, why didn't you call me back? And I called him and texted him, right? And the guy's a retired engineer, right? So I'm, I'm doing my best, except for running over and banging on the door to try to get this guy, save this guy six G's in. But he said, he just, he said, I, forget about it. I just had them do it. I'm like, oh, okay, fine, fine, right? Fine. More yeah. money than sense, in my opinion. There you go. Right? It's, it's, it's not going to matter when you and some of the things that I've learned from you, from an appraisal perspective, when you go in to look at a house, do you give a real big bump if you got it from Micah countertop versus granite? Yeah, maybe a little bit, but not much. As long as it's a, as long as it's a functional kitchen, what do you care? It, it does put you in a different category. So, yeah. for instance, so as I as I said this before, the appraisers are like super buyers. We're super persnickety buyers, right? So. Yeah. I'm like that. I'm like that dude who rolls in, and if I see if I see granite with a nice backsplash 
Yeah. And it looks good and it's the right, yeah. the current color combinations yeah. and yeah. it looks good. It makes me feel good. And I'm like, I don't have to do nothing. Well, if yeah. you were here, you're here now. Right. That's where we're starting from. Right. Right. <laughs> so yeah. in relation to this though, in relation to a furnace, I don't want to give it, I mean, I, yeah. I walk in in the middle of winter, I walk in, is the heat on? Yeah. Yeah. It's a water heater. I think you typically <laughs> want, you, you want the utilities on. And I yeah. know I've had situations in appraisals where the appraiser said, you got to have the water on and we got to yeah. have the water, the furnace and water heater have to be operational. Yeah. Um, so you can, so you can test yeah. it. They work. Yeah. yeah. See if they work, but right? As long as they work, yeah. I don't care from an appraisal standpoint and from, a, from your in buyer standpoint, nobody gives a crap if you spent $20,000 yeah. on a furnace or if you yeah. spent a thousand, yeah. just, it just has to work. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. it. So, and so to take that, whole statement home right the other perspective is from the home inspector right so the home inspector is going to test the furnace to make sure it's working he's looking for a blue flame right and if it's not a blue flame if it's orangey he's going to knock it a bit he's going to talk about why it's not you got some you got some some build up here right 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 and, and so he's putting the he's putting this in the buyer's mind and so the buyer's like oh my god i gotta do something to the furnace i gotta do this or that so it's like, it doesn't matter, right? As long as the furnace is operational, he, he does I've never heard a furnace inspector say, you've got an F-Con instead of a Bryant, therefore this F-Con is crap. Never. All the home, and I've gone through hundreds of home inspectors in 22 years as a realtor, never. So it doesn't matter. So, you know, you do as, a, as an investor need to know what makes the most sense from a cost perspective, right? And also perception of the buyer, which is important. Very, that's very important. But you, those things you'll you'll learn. And part of that, you could just be, you can just roll through, um, you know, the various websites. Look at Zillow and Truly and Realtor.com, and look at the houses and look at what's in the houses. Pinterest. These are all good sites in terms of learning what's out there in your perspective market. Mm -hmm. You do need to know your market, but um, that's individualized, and you can, you know, hone that down as you move through and decide, you know, where you're going to focus. Because me, like I say, I always focus on the A market. So in Detroit, it's probably the top five or six markets in Detroit, the sub markets within Detroit, you know, East Indian Village, you know, Bagley, Bagley Highmark, yeah. Rosedale, mm -hmm. Palmer Woods, the, the higher end areas that have basically sustained and that are going up, up at price point from, from a Detroit perspective. I don't buy in the lesser neighborhoods, you know, from that perspective. You know, sure. it's just about, about buying a property, right? You know. Sure. But if you did, again, the, the same thing holds true, right? It's a matter yeah. of making sure that you are one, you're rehabbing or renovating to the level of the area, plus a yeah. little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> plus just yeah. a little. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a, be that yeah. much. Because yeah. in your example, the reality yeah. is the difference for a, a thousand square foot house home, yeah. the yeah. difference in cost between a Formica countertop and a single slab granite countertop. About 600 bucks, maybe. Maybe. Somewhere around there. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I got a good granite guy. He'll turn me around in, in, in about a week. I found him. I love him to death. You know, he surprises yep. me. I, I just did a granite job with him two weeks ago. And he tells me, he said, I go pick. He said, you got to come pick the granite out. So I didn't go, but I, but I said, put the granite in this house that you put in my Tuttle Hill house. And I found a thick picture of it. He said, yes, that's what it is. I said, yes, what I want. And he said, well, I can have it for you Wednesday. I'm like, okay, fine. Right. So I get a call from my guys Monday. Your granite is in. I'm like, he just, he said he's putting it in Wednesday. What do you mean my granite is in? What? He said, well, I had some free time. It's you, Kev. I want to get you to take care. So he took care of me like two or three days earlier than he'd planned. And we, we, we weren't quite ready cabinet wise for it, but my guys were there. So they got stuff squared away to, to make it easier for them to get to get the granite in right mm -hmm. uh, but to the granite also i'm just just a little inside baseball first of all granite is like diamonds they're different grades so yeah. when you put granite in the house you don't know whether it's the, the highest grade or the lowest grade and quite frankly 99.9% .9 of the public can't tell the difference yep. right even yep. as an appraiser you go in and you see granite you don't know the grade you just know it's granite right yep Normally, I buy the low grade. I don't buy the mid, I buy the low, which is usually somewhere around $35 to $45 a square foot. It's 
what I typically buy, but it's nice granite, it looks great. Um, but I also buy remnant pieces. So the remnants are the cast offs or what's left over from a, from a granite job that you know they just put in their yard, just extra that they sell usually by the piece and it's way less expensive. So if, mm-hmm. instead of it being maybe $50 a square foot, it might be 25 and it's, and it's a nice grant. Or I'm, let's say it's maybe a $75 a square foot, but I can get it for 35 or 40. I'll take yeah. it. Yeah. Depending on you know, if my, if my um, and I did that on my Easy Street project actually, because I had limited cabinets, limited counter space. And so it lent itself to a remnant, right? And so I went out and I picked this beautiful piece out. He said, normally this is like $65. I got it for like, I think 45 and it worked out great. Small you know, piece, small area. area. You get yeah. it at a discount, yeah, might just, as well. Just to save you, save you some money. Cause when mama comes in and she sees the granite, tire backsplash, stainless steel appliances, it's all over but the shop at that point. Yep. Every single time. Yep. Every single time. Because she's walked in all the other houses at that price point, and they typically got for mica countertops. They might have a backsplash, maybe. They typically don't have both or all three. Granite countertop, tile backsplash, stainless steel appliances. They don't typically have all three. So I got all three. Yeah. At the same price point, they're like, well, why are we looking? Our house looks nice. Let's get it inspected. Let's get the offer in and let's go. Yep. 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 One of the things that I'm finding on my end is in situations like that, they're not even, they don't even care about the inspection because yeah. Yeah. Uh, even in, even though our market has slowed, it's not as, as steep as it used to be. Mm-hmm. You know, they want that house and they know yeah. that if they don't make that offer quickly and make it attractive to the seller, yeah. they're not going to get it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that goes back to also me also making sure my prices come in at top of market value in terms of what's in the house and what it looks like. Sure. Right? So sure. they're going to make an offer quicker on that house than they do at somebody else's house. It may be slightly less, you know, by, you know, four or five, maybe $10,000. But it's like, man, we go in here. And the other part is these people, the first time home buyers, now that kitchen becomes a showpiece. Yes. Right? We're forgetting, we're forgetting all about that. I mean, you know, in these kitchens because family spending a lot of time in there, um, you know, with the kids or when they have gatherings and the holidays. And, they, and, and, you know, at first I had this one client, they got their house just before Thanksgiving and we put all the toys in it. And she was the first time she felt comfortable in having a Thanksgiving dinner at her, at house, her house. At her house. And that is a big deal. Put all the toys in the granite countertops, the stainless steel, the stainless steel appliances, mm-hmm. um, tile backsplash. Um, I think we even opened up the wall. We gave her a, a, a pass a, through, a, a pass through from between the, the kitchen and the living room dining room area, um, and it just it just pimped everything out. She loved it. She still I, she's a friend of mine, so I still talk to her. And she bought her house just before we had this this real well this super accelerated price point so she bought about three years ago not quite three years ago and it was an investment property quick story so when she saw the property at first the homeowners hadn't moved out the place was an absolute wreck and she walked in she's like oh my god i'm like we normally normally don't i normally do not show houses to buyers when they're in that condition i mean that was a tip that was a tip (laughs) that was a tip right so the ceiling in one of the bedrooms was caving in and they had a bucket on a dresser because there's a roof uh-huh. right yeah. you walked in and were like yes money yeah. <laughs> yeah right and so the half bathroom and the homeowner admitted she said she hadn't been in that half bathroom in like two years on the, on the main floor it was yes exactly that face mm-hmm. exactly that face right so i'm like I'm excited, but I'm like, how do people live like this? The house was a was was a wreck, and we well we again Apple Ridge prime example, right? So perfect example, <laughs> perfect example. Perfect example. Right? How do people live in this kind of stuff? Yeah. And that's happened to me. This last two years has been a revelation, man, in terms of how people live in yeah. the house that I'm I'm buying in Ipsy Township, not Apple Ridge, but the other one, which I won't name, give the address. Same thing, twenty two hundred square foot house, three bedrooms, three and a half bath brick 
Cologne, brick and vinyl colonial, beautiful neighborhood. The house is an absolute pigsty. It was perfect. Perfect. Everything down to the last minute details. Yeah. And people are living in it with young kids every single day. And it yeah. was yeah. it was terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Now I got it at a great price. But it was like, hey, oh my God. I got a question for you. So do yeah. you feel bad when you find a house like that and you get it at a good price because the owners clearly haven't taken care of it? Because oh, there's just... a here's why I asked that. There are some people who believe that we as investors are taking advantage, taking advantage of folk in bad situations. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so I'll use, I've got two answers for you. I'll use the house that I just spoke about as an example. That house was brought to me by a real estate agent who felt that she could not put it on the market to sell it. This is in such bad condition. Okay. So and she's so a she real was, estate agent. Real estate agent. She licensed to sell real estate. Right. Like right. this one. But right. for whatever reason, she felt she couldn't sell it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, okay. Yeah. Because the house was nasty. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Okay. Filthy. Filthy. Filthy nasty. Yeah. Filthy was an F. Filthy. 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 Fil no. Filthy. <laughs> filthy. That's not filthy. It's filthy. F. Filthy. F filthy. filthy. Ooh, yes. That's yes. really nasty. Yeah, that's that's really nasty. You know, I got photos that like I can show you, but it was, and then they had young kids living in this mess. Okay. I think young, she was like she's four years old. I walk in there, and I so it, I just shook my head, man. I shook my head. Um, and I got I went out, I went down in the basement. So the son, who I found out later was a recovering meth addict, was living in the basement, and it was filthy nasty down there. So I'm a little naive, man. So I'm taking my pictures and shooting a little video. So I see this thing laying on the floor, right? I'm like, what is that? And it was a a toy of some type. Let's just leave it at that. What the hell you say? So anyway, um, so I'm like, I, I just, it was just, it was just crazy to me. You know, so we actually got him out of a situation. We didn't know all the backstory. There's always backstory, right? There's always backstory. The backstory was she, the lady who lived there was actually going through a divorce, which we didn't know at the time. We found out later because my guys were there cleaning the house out and the ex-husband shows up. And he didn't know what was going on. <laughs> I'm in danger. So he was blindsided and upset. And so um, he didn't do anything, you know, cause a, a commotion or a scene or anything. But Fortunately, fortunately. Well, fortunately for him, because my guys are appropriately protected, so he yeah. would have had a bad day. Yes. So, so any, so anyway, um, we were we are helping them out of a, out of a bad out of a bad situation, and we're giving them the price that they asked for. They asked for the price, and so the the realtor, what she did do, she did have an as is appraisal done, and so we we're pretty much giving them the as is appraisal price. Okay. So that situation, we're helping them out. And then the other part of this is she's a realtor. She's not collecting the wholesaler fee, which wholesaler fees typically tend to be higher than regular realtor fees. Um, so she's just collecting her regular, you know, 3% or 6% realtor fee, and that's it. That's collusion. You know. <laughs> that's collusion. It's, it's not 3% or 6%. It's whatever it's not, they negotiate. Mm, okay. All right. All right, we won't, okay. So now I said there's a two-parter to this. The other part of it is when I'm dealing with investors, present company excluded, um, where I've seen that, and, and, and I'll, I'm going to step back for a second. It only happened that I'm aware of probably in one deal. And that was the deal that I did in Tuttle Hill where there were three, it was a daisy chain of, I think, three wholesalers. Okay. And when I finally, finally got the final statement to find out how much the, the homeowner got, versus the vultures versus the wholesalers, I was quite, I was upset because I really felt that the homeowners really did get taken advantage of. But that was, that was rare. Um, uh, in most cases, um, that's not the case. You know, 
um, and you know, with, with wholesalers, um, you know, I mean, you're knowledgeable because you bring your appraisal background to the table. A lot of these wholesalers really don't know what they're doing and do a bit of a disservice, in my opinion, to homeowners because they don't. There are, there are good wholesalers out there like yourself, and then there are ones who aren't so good, you know? And, and so I, I tend to deal with them all, um, but- um, Same thing with agents. Yeah, to, to a certain agents. degree, but, it, but we do have a certain level of accountability and we can lose our license for malpractice. Um, and we do have sanctioning bodies, you yes. know? Okay, As okay. A, we're gonna have to talk about this more. We'll talk about, I will say well, this, as yeah. a broker, Mm -hmm. And I have sold real estate. Mm -hmm. I can legitimately say okay. that I receive more, there are more sanctions associated with me appraising a property or doing an appraisal and somebody not liking my valuation just because they don't like it mm -hmm. than there are for me totally botching a, a real estate sale. Yeah. Okay. All right. I so, won't disagree. I won't disagree, but but I will say in in terms of real estate, it does come down to again the experience of the agent and their broker. And yes. their broker, right? Yes. So I'm present company in terms of my wife in the business forty something years, never been sanctioned by the state board or brokerage or her. Always passing with a clean bill of health whenever they come in to audit her. She all always plastic with flying colors, but she understands that, right? And if she's got an agent that's a problem child, she gets rid of him, right? She gets rid of him. You know, as, as what is this? As Spock says, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Absolutely. So she's gotten rid of some mega agents who were top producers because they weren't doing good business. Absolutely. I mean, it's not like she won't talk to them and and basically try to counsel them, but if if not, I mean, she'll get rid of them. I mean, like we you, talk about that. Reputation mean, matters. Yeah, yeah, and her reputation is everything. Right. So she'll give you your life, your card, and you can go work for somebody else. It'll be somebody else's headache. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. You know? So, all right, man. So what else you got for me? Well, I wanted to ask ask you quickly, because I'm, I'm trying to in my head, I was I was trying to I wanted to hit the points that would stop somebody from getting into yeah. the business. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about for just a quick sec. So I go we talked about this before we got on, but the um, paralysis by analysis, people getting in their own way, right? Um, people, and, say that again. Uh, people doing what? Getting the, getting in their own way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so for me, uh, you know, I, I tried, I tried not to be the impediment to my own success. Don't um, be the impediment to your own success. Yeah. Yeah. It ought to yeah. be a t-shirt. Yeah, what is impediment? What is what does that mean? You look it up, son. Yeah, no, look at that. <laughs> yeah, Google it, brother. Google it. You went to private school, didn't you? Who <laughs> me? Detroit Public School, DPS, man. But uh, hey, man. so, but that was that's the big. Thing. So, real quick story, man. I talk to on an annual basis, probably let's say maybe ten to twenty people a year about getting into real estate. Yeah, right. I, I'm like. Here's my card. You got any questions? Call me, email me, text me. I'm happy to help. Whatever you need, any information you need, whatever, just let me know, right? Um, and then they'll ask me. Some of the ones who, who want to take the next step will ask me, "Well, what do I need to do to start?" So a lot of the things that I just told you, I tell them. Now, in my mind, it's become a bit of a game, right? It's like, well, I just told you five things to do. We'll see if you follow through, right? If I tell ten, if I tell, if I talk to ten, usually one or two, maybe three will take the next step, and maybe, and usually it's like one person will go all the way, one. So to that end, my painter, I met him last year. He was painting our house. Young dude, 20, 27, 28 years old. Never seen this guy before in my life. We talked in my doorway for probably an hour or two about real estate investing because he wants to get into real estate investing. Now, at that point, he already owned a paint company at 28 years old. Successful paint company. He has, got, he has about eight or nine people that work for him. He bills, um, his billings are, and people who know paint would know this, he's probably billing somewhere around thirty to $50,000 a month in paint. That's a lot of, that's a lot of paint. 
That's a lot of paint. Um, he has builders that he paints for, developers that he paints for, um, as well as private homeowners that he paints for. But he wanted to get into real estate. And so I told him what to do and forgot about it. And that next thing I know, next, this year, I get a call from this kid. I did what you told me to do. I'm like, fuck, I don't even remember what I, I don't remember what I told you. What did I tell you, man? What did I tell you? What did I, what did I tell you? I don't remember. You know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't tell him to go out and rob a bank, right? Or beat somebody up, but it was Absolutely. good advice, whatever, whatever that was, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you, you recounted him like, yeah, that sounds like something I would say. So out of that came a real deep abiding relationship because this guy reminds me of a younger version of me. He's just a, as he says, I'll run through a brick wall, I do. To get to my objective, I'll run through a brick wall. And it's always a good objective, right? It's not never bad, it's yeah. always there. He, and, um, he has so, vision uh, and he follows through. Yeah, yeah. And, he's, and he's organized and he's smart and he's wise. And I'm like, how can a kid this be this young? Because there's certain things he would say. It, it was it was just wisdom speak. I'm like, dude, really? So I got a chance to meet his dad. And so his dad is a master carpenter. So I've had his dad work for me. I've also had him to instruct my guys because he likes to teach. So I actually had him do a class for some of my contractors to teach them to you know, kind of a master class. You know, for a day he came in and taught him how to do crown molding. Mm -hmm. And he worked with them and evaluated them. That's a whole nother story so anyway this kid was the only one i said you know of all the people i talked to you're the only one that basically executed on what i asked him and slash told him to do and he looked at me and said really and he just laughed he said it was great advice right and so now we are de facto business partners on deals now um and he is a go-getter he is a hard worker um because of my project on harding and it's a landy hopefully you'll get up here and you can come through it and see it Okay. Um, and so he did the paint for me up there. This is the first start to finish paint job I've had him do. But because he's a high-end painter, he's brought a whole nother level of finish to my projects. You know, and I'm like, and so and it, to the point where my contractors are basically saying something. All good. Like, wow. You know, I mean, complimenting the work. And, um, but... He came, he came on job site and he was working, doing some extra stuff around the site. And so my contractors that were there, they lifted their game up. They picked their game up. They didn't want to be outworked by this kid. <laughs> yeah, boy. He mentioned it and I just started laughing. I said, normally, you know, they don't work, they don't work this hard, man. They're working this hard because now they were wondering who you were. And when you told them you were one of the investors, then they were on notice. And that's what happened, you know? And they and they picked their they picked their game up and started working a little bit more digital diligently a little harder a little bit more efficiently you know um but my point being the analysis you know the paralysis by analysis part this kid did not let that stand in his way um but i from talking to his dad his dad said i raised him that way you know and so he, it's funny because he sometimes is because his dad is also hangs drywall and finishes drywall so sometimes they'll work together on projects and so the interplay between the two, because the son comes in and paints the drywall and primes it after dad hangs the drywall. So he sometimes has to chastise his dad for a core workmanship. So that's fine. You know, <laughs> so dad, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta fix his corner. You gotta, you, you, know, you, you, know, like, you know, and, uh, and, but, but, but the inside of it is it's all in love. Um, they have a, they have a super great relationship. Um, actually the dad is a, he's actually a pastor as well. So I'm like, dude, how do you find the time to do everything you do? And then he, you know, he preaches on Sunday and Thursday. I'm like, it's just amazing to me. Really good people, man. Really, Absolutely. really, 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 really good people. But going back to the point of, you know, if I talk to 10, one may, one may, one may work. And this go, even goes to my, my own family. I've tried to pass this knowledge on to my own siblings and um, nephews and nieces. And none of them have, have really taking me up on it to the degree that I would hope they would. And so, um, and, and, and typically I may tend to be a little bit more serious with them. And uh, I have, my, my expectations tend to be maybe higher, but um, it, I find that disheartening. But I've talked to enough investors and contractors to know that it's common 
in their families when they try to, and we've talked about this too, when you want to pass that knowledge on, they expect you to just lay down and give it to them with maybe no expectation or to cut them slack when you got to work at this, man. You you do have you do have access through me, but it's my word out here that I'm putting on you to go in and do this. And I've had it happen on numerous occasions where, you know, I've gotten them opportunities and they've just fumbled it. They've just fumbled the ball, man, big time. And so I find that really, really disheartening, really. When I can see down the road past where they're trying to get and know the roadblocks and the obstacles that they're going to run into. And then I'm trying my best, just like if you're a parent, to keep your kid from basically running into that brick wall at 60 miles an hour. And they still want to do it regardless. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just, when you said, when you're talking about a parent, one of the, one of the funniest things, and, and this is completely inappropriate, but it's it's the way that I think. I think my job is to make sure that my, my kids don't end up on the pole yeah. to quote Chris yeah. Rock, right? Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, at, at the same time, in that vein, I, the theory being that I want to teach them so that they can take care of themselves and they can they can take advantage of the thing of the opportunities that we put in front of them. You have created the space that you've created with these opportunities, and they yeah. and so as they were born into it, they don't appreciate it because they didn't have to work to get it, you know. And I often make an analogy of of nature when you look at nature, when you look at any any animal that's raising its offspring, one of the first things it does, it teaches them about the dangers, about the dangers, unless you're unless you're an apex predator. But if you're a deer, there's certain times of the day in certain places you don't go. <laughs> you know, and any other and any other animal, and it's been passed down through eons, yeah. right? You it's don't genetic make memory. You it's make in wind the up DNA. on somebody's table, right? In our life, it's kind of the same thing. And even now with, with everything that's going on in the world, it's even more so, you know, with social media and everything that's at your fingertips, man, you make a couple button clicks wrong, that stuff will follow you the rest of your the rest of your life. Yep. You know, those mistakes. Oh, I did that when I was 12. I don't even remember that. Yeah, well, the employer found it. And guess what? Eh, you may not get this job because you did something silly when you were barely, barely a teenager. Mm-hmm. Oh, my dad told me I probably shouldn't have done it shit. So they, it's like people say, well, they got to make their own mistakes. Well, I guess that's true. You know, uh, in most of the mistakes they make won't cost them dearly, you know, but some of them potentially could and will, you know, and, you know, you're trying to teach them how to be a good citizen, but in doing so, they're teaching their kids. They're going to teach their kids how to be good citizens, and on yeah. and on and on. That's what passes that legacy down. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, anyway. All right, man. We got to both get back to work. <laughs> so, uh, okay. You okay. know what? Then, We're gonna have to do this again because there because I had some other stuff that I wanted to talk about, but frankly, we out of time, man. Yeah, we out of time. Okay. So, and I'll, I'm gonna close with this. One of the reasons, and most people don't ask me this, that I do what I do in terms of wanting to help the work with people is I've been lucky in my life to a certain degree and we won't talk about how I got here, where I came from, but I, I figured out early on the things that make me the happiest is when I give to people. Hmm. You know, I've had bling, I've got, I've had nice cars, I got nice cars, I got nice jewelry, I get to go to nice destinations. I was just in Miami weekend before last hanging out. I think I told you a lot of photos. I sent you, I sent you photos, and it was a crazy time, right? Even with the wife. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but for yeah, me, we don't send I photos give, at other times. <laughs> yeah, when I give back to people, that's what gives me the most satisfaction, you know. And I figured that out a long, long time ago as a, as a youngster. The things that, I mean, when I think back on them, it still it makes me smile. It gives me chills, you know. It warms it warms my heart so for me to pass on the knowledge that i've that i've gotten from the people that i've gotten it from um i like doing it you know people will do with it what they will yeah uh, but it's not anything that's going to hurt anybody yeah. you know i mean the knowledge that i'm giving it's 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 pretty much it's pretty much harmless for the most yeah. part you know, unless you do yeah. something with it and then you can be dangerous. So i want people i want people to do with do something with it well some of my 
buddies who say, well, they're going to be a competitor. They're going to be this. They're going to be that. There's enough to go around, man. I'm not worried about them becoming yeah. a competitor. I'm really not. Yeah. Really not worried about them. That's one of the things that I, um, I've actually heard that. Uh, I was trying to teach a, a share. I was trying to share some information with some, some guys. One of them li literally said, well, if this is so good, why are you telling me? And the thing that with the thing that threw me off about this is because I was like, well, fuck, I was 40 years old when I found out. So <laughs> I'm trying to share what took me 40 years to learn. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. And, and it, it's really in hope. And I'm assuming he looked like us. Yeah. OK. And, and so for me and probably for you, too, I've been lucky enough to be around other ethnic groups and they share information all the time. All the time. All the time. Right. And, and um and so I've been able to sit down and to a certain degree have have some fairly serious discussions in that regard. You know, you know, my some of my Middle Eastern friends that I'm they call me brother, but you know, we're not brothers, but we can have I can say, Well, how did you guys do this? How did you guys do that? Some of the insights into how they got to where they got to. You know, and it goes back gener gener generationally, how they move their money through their, you know, their banking system, their internal banking system and how they move money, how they how they operate. And, you know, the Asians do it. Indians do it. Middle Easterners do it probably to a very high degree. Africans um, do it. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Africans okay. do it. Yeah. I'm not surprised. I work with I work with a bunch of a bunch of Africans and how they view us. It's African-Americans that have the issue. Yeah, yeah. In this particular instance. Yes. Yes. So anyway, man, if you don't stop, you know, we're not going to shut up. So you got to, you got to end this. You got to, you got to. So with that, Kevin, I'm going to catch up with yeah. you later, my man. All right, brother. Take care. Thanks. No, thank you. Not a problem. Take care.